I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I want to talk about what matters and what doesn't, particularly in reference to this coming year. You know, it's appropriate to consider what matters, what do you care about, and what don't you care about or shouldn't care so much about. When something matters to you or to me, uh, it's important. You value it, right? You give it your attention. You bring resources to it. It could be for yourself or for others or for all of us. On the other hand, when something does not matter to you, it's not a priority. You disengage from it. You don't feed it. You shift your attention away from it. Now, beyond really primal survival needs, like while drowning, gasping for air, and I've been there, uh, or pulling your child back from the path of an onrushing bus, never been there, but it's been close. Uh, other than those primal survival moments, what matters to us is fundamentally a personal choice, even if in the face of strong habits or cultural conditioning. What matters to you may not matter to others, and what matters to them may not matter to you. It's your choice and your responsibility, good news and bad news. So what matters to you in general and in particular this year? Let's explore this both in terms of our neuropsychology and wisdom from the Buddha. Uh, I invite you to engage this as a kind of guided reflection. A way to begin that I find really useful is to consider what matters in terms of our three fundamental needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. These are the needs that every animal has. Even a Buddha animal has needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Uh, so we need to be safe, satisfied, and connected, and it's important to feel as safe, satisfied, and connected as we actually are. One good reason for this is that when you actually are, you know, having your needs basically met enough, maybe not perfectly, but actually met enough in the moment, and you let the sense of that land, that removes fuel from the fire of craving that the Buddha has pointed out creates so much suffering and harm because craving is a drive state based on something missing or disturbed in the meeting of an important need. Aha, when we have our needs actually met and we experience that they're actually met, the actual basis for craving fades away and along with it, so much suffering and harm. This is a profoundly useful observation about the facts of our own neurobiology. So let's pause for a bit uh, for each of these three needs as you consider the coming year. And you think about and you consider what could you realistically do in your thoughts and words and needs to be safer, both physically and emotionally. What would help you be safer in your physical health, perhaps? Maybe in your savings, your financial stability and economies that use money, which is just about all of them. Uh, you know, what might help you to be safer from emotional attacks by others or mistreatment by others? that you could realistically do with your thoughts and words and deeds. You don't, we're just gonna take a minute or so with each one of these. You don't need to map out an entire action plan for your whole year. Very often, something will come up for you, an intuition, like, oh, I need to get that checkup that I've postponed for my medical checkup. Or you might realize, you know, I've just kind of had it with being bashed by that person or 
endlessly criticized. And I'm just going to take a step back emotionally in that relationship. Or you might realize that, as I have, you're getting old enough that now is the time to put it in gear for a regular exercise, aerobics and, and weights, whatever's appropriate for you. So what this year would help you to be safer and to feel safer? Feeling safer meaning releasing unnecessary anxiety, letting it go, all that unnecessary rumination and worry and general uh, attitude of apprehensiveness when you're actually quite pretty safe, probably. It's up to you to decide for yourself, but what about letting go of unnecessary anxiety and helping yourself feel as safe as you reasonably are? Okay. How about satisfied? Hmm. What could you do this year? Thoughts, words, and deeds to bring more pleasure into your life, more enjoyment. Little things like slowing down a little bit to smell the flowers or to enjoy the clouds moving through the sky. Maybe get a looser <laughs> pair of shoes, not so tight. Uh, yeah. Are there some important accomplishments that you've been deferring and you know? Now's the time to finally tackle that kitchen drawer. Uh, give it the 45 minutes that will actually take to deal with it once and for all. You've been looking at that thing for 10 years now, maybe. Anything else that would help you feel more satisfied? Maybe shifting into or taking up something that helps you feel more fulfilled, something with meaning, maybe an act of service that's within your reach. Once a week, once a month maybe, doing something of real benefit to another person. And then in particular, how could you help yourself feel more satisfied in the present? Not to lie about or deny um, anything that is obstructing you, but disengaging from a mood of complaint about what you don't have and orienting more around thankfulness for what you do have. None of which means giving up important goals or um, fighting against injustice or dealing with real problems. It just means appreciating what is good alongside what is bad in a pragmatic sense. Gratitude. Taking in the good. Uh, for me, a deeply important, useful practice is looking for the sense of contentment, helping the mind rest in contentment rather than endlessly chasing habitually the next shiny thing. Mm -hmm. Letting yourself aspire without attachment to the results, being determined, caring, but fundamentally helping yourself be at peace with whatever happens. That's also under the heading of satisfaction. And last and not least, in this coming year, how could you both be more connected in ways that are really good for you and for others and feel more connected? Yeah. Maybe it's time to uh, deliberately spend more time with friends. Uh, have a dinner in your home once a month with at least someone, perhaps. Maybe eating outside if you can uh, in a time of COVID still. Uh, you know, how could you uh, be more receptive and present and actually more connected with various people? so that when you're with them, you really give them your full attention. Um, and of course, how could you feel more connected when you actually are? Both in the outflowing of your heart, 
your kindness, your caring, your compassion, your friendliness, you know, no matter what's not flowing into you, you can encourage an outflowing and an open heartedness that helps you feel connected, even if not much is coming your way. That's amazing. That's true. And also, when you actually are included or seen or appreciated or liked or loved, whoosh, let it sink in. Especially if, like me, when you were younger, it felt like there was an empty place in your heart from what you did not take in or receive in the first place. Connected. And then imagine moving through your year with a sense of what we've talked about right here mattering more to you. A sense of, okay, safety, being and feeling safer matters to me. And I'm going to move through the year valuing that need for all kinds of good reasons. Or feeling satisfied matters to you. Being and feeling satisfied in all kinds of ways this coming year. Letting it matter to you to meet that need and to feel that it's met. Ah. And then, of course, connected. Being more connected and feeling more connected, mattering to you. You're getting on your own side about this. Being for yourself about this in the coming year. So I'll be kind of quiet for a minute or two here. As you imagine moving through the year to come, I'll do it with you. Uh, moving through the year to come with a, uh, with a sense of making your own needs matter. Not making other needs matter less, but matter, you know, making your needs matter. Your needs to be safe, satisfied, and connected. Making that matter and letting it land when you actually are safe, satisfied, and connected as you go through the year. So imagine moving through this year in this way. into the spring in the Northern Hemisphere and moving toward the summer, how would you be? What would you do if these needs really mattered to you? And if it mattered to you to feel their fulfillment? Then moving through the summer, making your needs matter. And then into the fall of this year. Continuing to prioritize the meeting of your needs in appropriate ways. What would it be like to feel like your basic needs are met in a in a in the core of your being as you move through the fall? I'd be nicer. <laughs> and then moving into the winter toward the end of the year, November, December of this year, feeling like your needs matter and treating them like they matter. And feeling like they're, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're being more met in the ways that you can. I suspect that if that were the case for you, much like it would be for me, you'd be more peaceable. People become more peaceable and friendly and uh, fearless frankly, when they experience that their needs are being met 
in realistic ways in the core of their being. Okay. Now, let's talk about being tricked by the brain into making stuff matter that doesn't really. So um, the motivational machinery of your brain, my brain, the whole body, it's complicated, but I wanna highlight two aspects of it. The first is that recent research has shown that in one of the sort of motivational switchboards of your brain, the basal ganglia in the subcortex, the second floor of the house of the brain, in effect, as it was built in three floors during evolution, resting on top of the first floor of the brain, the brain stem, and under the third floor of the brain, the neocortex that sits on top of all that, the basal ganglia, two of them on one on each side of your brain, are very involved in motivation. And deep in the basal ganglia is a kind of evolutionarily ancient, a couple hundred million years old, probably, a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens, otherwise known as the ventral, which means lower, striatum. It's a little confusing. Both terms are often used. In any case, in the nucleus accumbens, in us and in our cousins, mice and rats, are these little tiny nodes that are engaged with liking or wanting, both positively and negatively valenced, you know, liking more or liking less, wanting more or wanting less. And the key point here is that, um, as the same proverb puts it, liking without wanting is heaven, wanting without liking is hell. In other words, we can decouple liking from wanting and disliking from aversion. Uh, in other words, it's normal to enjoy certain things. It's normal to dislike certain things, such as a tight pair of shoes or knowing that children go hungry. Um, that's normal, it's normal. There's a place for that. It's when we start moving into the intensity of wanting that is contracted, pressured, saturated with a sense of self, obsessive, angry, or panicked, fearful, that's when trouble begins. So right here we have this really important distinction. How can we rest in liking without getting hijacked into wanting? Because the brain is designed to want what it likes. All right. I'll be talking about the answer to that question, how? Second, we have this other circuit that tricks us into making things matter, you know, because the wanting circuitry makes certain things matter. Oh, I got to have a second banana. I want that banana. I made that second banana matter. I want it. All right. Another related circuit involves the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. When information comes in, the amygdala, also in the subcortex on both sides of your brain, two of them, um, it's continually evaluating what's coming through as whether it's you know pleasant or unpleasant and whether it is salient, whether it matters. And very often a stimulus will arise. It'll come in from the outside or from the inside and it'll go to the amygdala, which is then conditioned by our history and influenced by the uh, labeling of the stimulus by the, another part of the brain nearby, the hippocampus. And then the amygdala very quickly initiates a response that moves into chasing that which seems pleasurable or uh, fighting or fleeing from or freezing in the face of that which is unpleasant. And that reactivity happens in a third of a second easily. Meanwhile, information starts trickling into the prefrontal cortex a second or two later in terms of its full clarity, maybe even longer. But meanwhile, the amygdala has kicked off a stress reaction, 
hormones are starting to be released, adrenaline and cortisol, uh, or you know, surges of neuro ac neural activity are moving through you know, the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, revving it up, or moving through the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, freezing it down, the human equivalent of playing dead, and all that has happened before the prefrontal cortex has had time to catch up. In other words, the amygdala, that kind of amygdala hijack, that term, is suddenly making something matter that actually if you know your prefrontal cortex had come online sooner, it could tell you, ah, it doesn't matter that much after all. We don't have to go really nuts to chase after that or run away from that, you know. Oof. It doesn't matter that much. But that circuitry tricks us, tricks us into making things matter. So, you know, it's really interesting what happens, right? We kick into overdrive either way, and we feel like something's oh so important, right? But then later we look back on the mood we were in and we go, you know, and the things that we did and the things that we said and the wreckage around us, including other people who are like, whoa, what was that? And it's a little bit as if we woke up from a dream, right? Who was that angry person? Who was that way too buzzed person? Who was that person driving their point in that meeting? Oh, it was me. What? <laughs> right? You've been there, right? I've been there. So what are we going to do about this? To deal with this well-intended trickery, which is designed uh, through evolution and forged in the crucible of evolution uh, to help Mother Nature's little baby survive and pass on genes that pass on genes, still, this trickery of mattering uh, creates a lot of suffering and harm. What can we do about it? Well, the Buddha and other traditions, as well as modern neuropsychology, has some good advice for us. Basically, to summarize, we can train outside the heat of the moment, and we can draw on what we've cultivated, what we've trained and developed inside ourselves during the heat of the moment. And if you're having a hard time practicing in the heat of the moment, train more outside of it. That's a really useful general principle. If you're having a hard time acting on what you know in the heat of the moment, train more, develop more, cultivate more, practice more outside the heat of the moment. Good general principle. So here's some keys. I want to first talk about training. I want to highlight certain things. One is internalize experiences of needs already met many times a day when it's true. You feel a little safe, you feel a little satisfied, you feel a little connected, slow down and let it sink in, which will gradually hardwire the neural substrates of resilient well-being and calm strength into your nervous system. Absolutely central practice. Multiple times a day, taking the good of ex genuine experiences, authentic experiences of needs met enough in the moment again and again and again. This is especially important if your needs aren't being met that much because it will strengthen you to cope with that, including maybe find ways to meet them better. And it, this is also especially true if you have a history of not having your needs met or being actively obstructed. It's especially important today to internalize experiences of needs met if you have that kind of history as I've had in particularly in my relationships when I was young. Second training, key, is mindfulness. Present moment awareness. Simple, straightforward, present moment awareness, sustained, breath after breath, awareness of both the outer and the inner worlds. That's mindfulness. Many wonderful trainings in mindfulness. Really good things to do. Third, compassion for others and yourself, a warm-heartedness, cultivating, training, a warm and open heart. You know, I think about this quotation from the Dalai Lama, as soon as I wake up, I think about altruism. Wow, think about how can I be helpful to other people? Not to empty myself so I'm running on fumes, but 
um, just as part of an overflowing wellspring of open-heartedness and lovingness moving through me. How can I um, be that way and, and radiate those qualities as a field that other people move through uh, that's not contingent on who they are? They just move through that field that's centered in and flowing outward from your own core. That's a third training, warm-heartedness, really important. Also, insight, sometimes called vipassana in Pali, the language, a primary language of early Buddhism, insight into what are called the three characteristics of all experience. So bear with me here. This might be a bit of a review for some of you. This is really useful. And certainly in Buddhism, it's foundational. The three characteristics of all experience. First, in Pali, anicca, generally translated as impermanence. In other words, all that is subject to arising is also subject to passing away. Anicca. Recognizing that characteristic in the stream of consciousness, in your own experiences. Second characteristic, dukkha. This is a really important word that's routinely mistranslated as suffering, which has created, I think, huge problems in Western Buddhism and in some places in the East as well. In other words, dukkha means, this, the Buddha pointed out, that all experiences have the characteristic of dukkha in that sometimes unpleasant experiences occur. All right, doesn't mean they always occur or only occur, but sometimes things are painful, unpleasant, physically, emotionally, subtle to agonizing. Okay, second attribute of dukkha. Pleasant experiences come to an end as a feature of anicca, impermanence. Okay, pleasant experiences end. They're often replaced by another pleasant experience or, you know, um, it, since... Uh, you know, pleasant experiences end, unpleasant ones do as well. But okay, pleasant experiences end. We don't have to be attached to them, continuing. And all experiences are made of parts that are connected and changing. Dukkha alone is not suffering. Dukkha becomes suffering when we attach craving to it. That's a key. Dukkha without craving is simply the way it is. Some things are pleasant, some things are unpleasant. All experiences have this kind of foamy and substantial dynamic quality. That's not a problem in and of itself. It only becomes a problem when we add craving to it. Bingo. That's a profoundly useful training. And the Buddha highlighted this again and again and again, the value of this kind of deepening insight into the fact, uh, the nature of all experiences. So we have anicca, impermanence, dukkha, second. Third, anatta. In other words, since all experiences are made of parts that are connected and changing, they, they all lack, they're all empty of an absolute essence or a single agent or owner. These insights have far-reaching implications. They may start out abstractly. I mean, the Buddha taught abstractly. He, used words, conveyed concepts, but you start to observe this in meditation and in daily life. Oh, wow, that's actually the case. You know, the streaming of consciousness, that's basically all that we have, all that we're aware of phenomenologically. You know, we live in a constructed streaming of experiences, constructed primarily, if not entirely, in our own body, um, you know, interacting with the wider world. Uh, Wow, <laughs> changing, you know, insubstantial, ownerless. Wow, when you really recognize that increasingly, it's harder and harder to trick you into making things matter that don't, right? And as this insight grows and it becomes more granular and more automatic in real time, you hold your experiences more lightly and take them less personally. Wow, and you become less prone to the reactivity of craving. Last training, spend more time in your own true nature. Awareness, just awareness as awareness, a field in which experiences occur. 
Pema Chodron put it, you are the sky, awareness. Everything else is just weather. Also, uh, innate goodness in your true nature. There's an innate goodness there, deep down. Fundamental lovingness, fundamental good intentions, fundamental movement to build up, to you know, rather than to tear down and destroy, um, and an underlying contentment, a kind of underlying even stillness and inner peace in your true nature. Rest more. Spend more time there. Try to clock at least a second a day, not a minute or two a day. Rest it in or in touch with your underlying true nature, which can be aided by a sense of the underlying ground of all that is unconditioned and timeless. Unconditioned and timeless. And perhaps the ground of all is imbued with qualities such as awareness, uh, kindness, and peace. So these five, these five trainings, there are more, but I'll repeat them. Training in internalizing your needs met enough already. Training in mindfulness. Training in a, an open and warm heart. Training in insight into the actual nature of all experiences. And training in cultivating and being in touch with your underlying true nature. All these will help you not be tricked, <laughs> including by uh, circuitry in your nucleus accumbens or your amygdala. And then in the, in the moment, practicing in the moment, there's some things that really help. First, what Tara Brock calls the sacred pause. Stop, right? Wait, uh, like the acronym WAIT from Chris Germer. Um, why am I talking? W-A-I-T or waste. Why am I still talking? <laughs> Pause, put the brakes on, buy yourself a moment or two or three, a few seconds for your prefrontal cortex to catch up with that amygdala, for you to recognize that you've been hijacked by wanting and you can return to simply resting in, liking some things and not liking other things, pleasant, unpleasant and neutral without moving into craving about them. Slow it down, even interactions, do other people a favor, slow it down. One of the great gifts for me uh, that I've tried to learn as a as a husband and a father, uh, and I've learned it because I you know failed in the past. Slow it down. One of the things I do a lot with couples when I was doing couples counseling, which I don't do anymore, I'm disengaging from that and engaging other things. Um, slow them down. Really useful. Second, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, try to widen your view. Get a sense of your body as a whole, the room as a whole, the situation as a whole, the relationship as a whole, <clears throat> the sweep of time, past, present, and future as a whole, among other benefits that will engage circuits on the side of your brain and other parts of your brain that will uh, make you less hijacked or tricked by making some things matter that don't really or are costly for you if you go down that road. Widen your view. Third, as Gil Fronstel put it, stop for suffering. Your own and others. And find compassion for it. And, you know, empathic concern that is moved to, to help, to ease suffering and to change its causes if you can. Right? Stop for suffering and find compassion. Fourth, remind yourself what really matters. Say it to yourself. I've been doing that more and more these days. That doesn't matter. I'll say to myself about something. I'll find myself ruminating about something or getting caught up about it or imagining something I'm going to say and my body's already starting to get rubbed up about it and say, oh, I'm going to say that in a meeting tomorrow. And whew. Hey, Rick, that doesn't matter, really. Right? So... You could say that doesn't matter, and you could say what does matter. What really matters is the greater good. What really matters is the long game. Play the long game to win. Maybe lose some battles to win some wars, metaphorically speaking. Um, what really matters? Remind yourself in the moment as best you can. Tell yourself what's important. Even if it's just 1% of you, 
the still quiet voice inside of wisdom uh, that tells you what really matters. Tell yourself and try to listen to it. Also, in general, turn toward, um, in the moment even, what matters. Once you've identified it, it as what carries you along, what lives through you, what, what is the current of your life. You know, try to find that tipping point so you're increasingly disengaging, including in the heat of the moment, from what doesn't matter and engaging in what does matter to you and to others, whatever that is. And let what matters, you know, be your will, in effect, carrying you along. Okay. And then, as we finish up, I'd like to consider a few examples of replacing what doesn't actually matter to you with what does. So replacing. So I'm going to use a few examples here, and I invite you to consider these. First, consider a habitual drivenness toward a problematic pleasure that is enjoyable for a brief time, yeah, but it does have long-term costs. Like drinking or smoking too much, or overeating uh, sweets or other carbohydrates. Certain sexual behaviors that may be pleasurable in the moment, but afterward you just kind of shake your head with yourself. Or numbing yourself out with dumb TV. Or other things that you kind of drive toward. Uh, one of the things I can get very driven about is getting to the bottom of my email inbox, as my wife knows, and the hours go by, where's my husband? Oh, he's lost in his inbox, fighting his way to the bottom. That's another kind of problematic pleasure, for some of us at least, certainly me. So, you know, what would actually matter to you instead of that? Like, in other words, there might be a short-term cost in which you don't get that particular pleasure, but, you, you, you know, though you're not being gratified in that way, there's a longer-term benefit for you and maybe others as well, stretching out over a longer period of time. So think about that. Maybe pick one thing and see if you can imagine turning toward what really does matter to you. Maybe greater sobriety, maybe greater physical health, maybe less stress. You know, more intimacy, really, emotionally, in a key relationship. So replacing what doesn't actually matter very much to you with what really does in the area of the pursuit of pleasure. This year, in other words. Yeah. In other words, I think about it as basically making a, you know, a deal with your future you. I mean, the present you can look back and think about some of the price that you've paid, the present you, for what that impulsive previous you chased in terms of certain pleasures. Huh. Gratifying in the moment. Gratifying, you know, for... For half an hour, costly for days to afterward. And think about making a better deal with your future self that you're not going to push your costs forward into the future so they land on that future you in terms of chasing problematic pleasures this year. And then second, Consider a pattern of emotional reactivity that may feel so necessary in the moment. Like, yeah, I'm going to get mad at them about that, but has a real long-term cost. What can you turn toward instead? For example, I said at the beginning that I've been looking at a kind of exasperation that can sometimes creep into valid input of different kinds by myself 
that doesn't need the exasperation or subtle sense of being annoyed or like, I can hardly believe it, you know, that slipping in. Um, it kind of feels good in the moment, like, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of righteousness. Uh, but wow, what a cost, you know? Or um, just dwelling unnecessarily in, in old guilts, old remorse, old beating yourself up, you know? Maybe that actually is not very valuable or for you anymore. You paid your price already. You don't need to beat yourself up anymore. You've paid your price, you know? You can turn toward a greater sense of uh, kindness toward yourself, forgiveness even toward yourself. You can forgive yourself. You can recognize that you did some things that were bad or wrong. I'm, you know, certainly have those myself. And you can feel, you know, a, a flow of appropriate remorse or regret, you know, when you remember things sometimes. But you don't have to keep beating yourself up about it, you know. You can move into a kind of releasing. That's the essence of forgiving. It's a releasing that is still clear-eyed. You know what your commitments are going forward, but you can let go. You can turn toward what matters, which is basic well-being and not lashing yourself or burdening yourself unnecessarily. And then last, how about something in your relationships that you could, that shouldn't, or you don't want to let it matter so much, and you could replace it with something that really does matter to you. For example, maybe you feel like impressing others matters a lot to you. Could you let it go? Should it actually matter? Does it actually matter that much? to impress other people or to have them, you know, think that you're um, really high and mighty in some way. I've chased that brass ring most of my life. And it's such a blessing to, to let it not matter anymore <laughs> and replace it with a sense of your own worth that's unconditional, that's independent. Or maybe to feel that worth in two ways, earned worth and unconditional worth. You've earned so much worth. You've done so many good things. You've had so many good intentions. You've tried really hard. You've accomplished many things. You've helped many people. Um, you've achieved what you've achieved. It's good enough. You're good enough. I'm good enough already. You're good enough already. Can you let it not matter so much about impressing others or getting their agreement or approval? That might be a big one. Maybe others in your relationships, letting go and of what doesn't matter, reminding yourself of what doesn't really matter or what you want to help yourself really believe doesn't matter and replacing that with what does this year. And then in my last minute or so, and we won't have time for any kind of Q&A or something. We'll just, and we'll finish close to on time here. In the last minute or so, I encourage you to just take a look at the year to come uh, based on a general sense of whatever you've gotten out of these reflections. What really matters to you? Dwell there. Invest there. Rest there. Protect there. Protect it. Make sanctuary, sacred ground for what truly matters to you. And help yourself. Disengage from. Stop chasing. Stop feeding. Stop identifying with. Stop crediting. What truly doesn't matter that much to you. Imagine what a beautiful year it will be for you on this basis. Turning toward what truly matters, turning away from what doesn't again and again and again. So that becomes the habit of your heart. 
Wouldn't that feel wonderful this year? Wow, think of the benefits for others. And let the motivation right now really sink in to live your year in this way. Leaning into and dwelling in what matters truly and letting go of what doesn't. Let the motivation to orient to this coming year in this way, really land inside. And let's finish with two teachings from the Buddha. First, think not lightly of good, saying, it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one Gathering it little by little fills oneself with good. That's fundamentally what we've been exploring here for this coming year. And last, one of my favorite teachings, train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. I'll put these two quotations in the chat, and then I'll ring the bell three times, and we'll come to a formal end. Thank <laughs> you.